Chapter 62 The Feast at Simon's House This chapter is based on portions taken from Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, Luke 7, and John chapters 11 and 12. Simon of Bethany was accounted a disciple of Jesus. He was one of the few Pharisees who had openly joined Christ's followers. He acknowledged Jesus as a teacher and hoped that he might be the Messiah, but he had not accepted him as a Savior. His character was not transformed. His principles were unchanged. Simon had been healed of the leprosy, and it was this that had drawn him to Jesus. He desired to show his gratitude, and at Christ's last visit to Bethany, he made a feast for the Savior and his disciples. This feast brought together many of the Jews. There was at this time much excitement at Jerusalem. Christ and his mission were attracting greater attention than ever before. Those who had come to the feast closely watched his movements, and some of them with unfriendly eyes. The Savior had reached Bethany only six days before the Passover, and according to his custom, had sought rest at the home of Lazarus. The crowds of travelers who passed on to the city spread the tidings that he was on his way to Jerusalem, and that he would rest over the Sabbath at Bethany. Among the people there was great enthusiasm. Many flocked to Bethany, some out of sympathy with Jesus, and others from curiosity to see one who had been raised from the dead. Many expected to hear from Lazarus a wonderful account of scenes witnessed after death. They were surprised that he told them nothing. He had nothing of this kind to tell. Inspiration declares, The dead know not anything. Their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. But Lazarus did have a wonderful testimony to bear in regard to the work of Christ. He had been raised from the dead for this purpose. With assurance and power he declared that Jesus was the Son of God. The reports carried back to Jerusalem by the visitors to Bethany increased the excitement. The people were eager to see and hear Jesus. There was a general inquiry as to whether Lazarus would accompany him to Jerusalem, and if the prophet would be crowned king at the Passover. The priests and rulers saw that their hold upon the people was still weakening, and their rage against Jesus grew more bitter. They could hardly wait for the opportunity of removing him forever from their way. As time passed, they began to fear that, after all, he might not come to Jerusalem. They remembered how often he had baffled their murderous designs, and they were fearful that he had now read their purposes against him and would remain away. They could ill conceal their anxiety and questioned among themselves, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? A council of the priests and Pharisees was called. Since the raising of Lazarus, the sympathies of the people were so fully with Christ that it would be dangerous to seize upon him openly. So the authorities determined to take him secretly and carry on the trial as quietly as possible. They hoped that when his condemnation became known, the fickle tide of public opinion would set in their favor. Thus they proposed to destroy Jesus. But so long as Lazarus lived, the priests and rabbis knew that they were not secure. The very existence of a man who had been four days in the grave and who had been restored by a word from Jesus, would sooner or later cause a reaction. The people would be avenged on their leaders for taking the life of one who could perform such a miracle. The Sanhedrin therefore decided that Lazarus also must die. To such lengths do envy and prejudice lead their slaves. The hatred and unbelief of the Jewish leaders had increased until they would even take the life of one whom infinite power had rescued from the grave. While this plotting was going on at Jerusalem, Jesus and his friends were invited to Simon's feast. At the table, the Savior sat with Simon, 
whom he had cured of a loathsome disease, on one side, and Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, on the other. Martha served at the table, but Mary was earnestly listening to every word from the lips of Jesus. In his mercy, Jesus had pardoned her sins. He had called forth her beloved brother from the grave, and Mary's heart was filled with gratitude. She had heard Jesus speak of his approaching death, and in her deep love and sorrow she had longed to show him honor. At great personal sacrifice, she had purchased an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very costly, with which to anoint his body. But now many were declaring that he was about to be crowned king. Her grief was turned to joy, and she was eager to be first in honoring her lord. Breaking her box of ointment, she poured its contents upon the head and feet of Jesus. Then, as she knelt weeping, moistening them with her tears, she wiped his feet with her long flowing hair. She had sought to avoid observation, and her movements might have passed unnoticed, but the ointment filled the room with its fragrance and published her act to all present. Judas looked upon this act with great displeasure. Instead of waiting to hear what Christ would say of the matter, he began to whisper his complaints to those near him, throwing reproach upon Christ for suffering such waste. Craftily he made suggestions that would be likely to cause disaffection. Judas was treasurer for the disciples, and from their little store he had secretly drawn for his own use, thus narrowing down their resources to a meager pittance. He was eager to put into the bag all that he could obtain. The treasure in the bag was often drawn upon to relieve the poor, and when something that Judas did not think essential was bought, he would say, Why is this waste? Why was not the cost of this put into the bag that I carry for the poor? Now the act of Mary was in such marked contrast to his selfishness that he was put to shame, and according to his custom he sought to assign a worthy motive for his objection to her gift. Turning to the disciples, he asked, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Judas had no heart for the poor. Had Mary's ointment been sold and the proceeds fallen into his possession, the poor would have received no benefit. Judas had a high opinion of his own executive ability. As a financier, he thought himself greatly superior to his fellow disciples, and he had led them to regard him in the same light. He had gained their confidence and had a strong influence over them. His professed sympathy for the poor deceived them, and his artful insinuation caused them to look distrustfully upon Mary's devotion. The murmur passed round the table. To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Mary heard the words of criticism. Her heart trembled within her. She feared that her sister would reproach her for extravagance. The master, too, might think her improvident. Without apology or excuse, she was about to shrink away when the voice of her Lord was heard. Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? He saw that she was embarrassed and distressed. He knew that in this act of service she had expressed her gratitude for the forgiveness of her sins, and he brought relief to her mind. Lifting his voice above the murmur of criticism, he said, She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will you may do them good. But me... You have not always. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. The fragrant gift which Mary had thought to lavish upon the dead body of the Saviour she poured upon his living form. At the burial its sweetness could only have pervaded the tomb. Now it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. Joseph of Arimathea 
and Nicodemus offered not their gift of love to Jesus in his life. With bitter tears they brought their costly spices for his cold, unconscious form. The women who bore spices to the tomb found their errand in vain, for he had risen. But Mary, pouring out her love upon the Savior while he was conscious of her devotion, was anointing him for the burial. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed, an earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones forever. Many there are who bring their precious gifts for the dead. As they stand about the cold, silent form, words of love are freely spoken. Tenderness, appreciation, devotion, all are lavished upon one who sees not nor hears. Had these words been spoken when the weary spirit needed them so much, when the ear could hear and the heart could feel, how precious would have been their fragrance! Mary knew not the full significance of her deed of love. She could not answer her accusers. She could not explain why she had chosen that occasion for anointing Jesus. The Holy Spirit had planned for her, and she had obeyed His promptings. Inspiration stoops to give no reason. An unseen presence, it speaks to mind and soul and moves the heart to action. It is its own justification. Christ told Mary the meaning of her act, and in this he gave her more than he had received. In that she hath poured this ointment on my body, he said. She did it for my burial. As the alabaster box was broken, and filled the whole house with its fragrance. So Christ was to die, his body was to be broken, but he was to rise from the tomb, and the fragrance of his life was to fill the earth. Christ hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verily I say unto you, Christ declared, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Looking into the future, the Savior spoke with certainty concerning his gospel. It was to be preached throughout the world, and as far as the gospel extended, Mary's gift would shed its fragrance and hearts would be blessed through her unstudied act. Kingdoms would rise and fall, the names of monarchs and conquerors would be forgotten, but this woman's deed would be immortalized upon the pages of sacred history. Until time should be no more, that broken alabaster box would tell the story of the abundant love of God for a fallen race. Mary's act was in marked contrast with that which Judas was about to do. What a sharp lesson Christ might have given him who had dropped the seed of criticism and evil thinking into the minds of the disciples. How justly the accuser might have been accused! He who reads the motives of every heart, and understands every action, might have opened before those at the feast dark chapters in the experience of Judas. The hollow pretense on which the traitor based his words might have been laid bare, for instead of sympathizing with the poor, he was robbing them of the money intended for their relief. Indignation might have been excited against him for his oppression of the widow, the orphan, and the hireling. But had Christ unmasked Judas, this would have been urged as a reason for the betrayal. And though charged with being a thief, Judas would have gained sympathy even among the disciples. The Savior reproached him not, and thus avoided giving him an excuse for his treachery. But the look which Jesus cast upon Judas convinced him that the Savior penetrated his hypocrisy and read his base, contemptible character. And in commending Mary's action, which had been so severely condemned, Christ had rebuked Judas. Prior to this, the Savior had never given him a direct rebuke. Now the reproof rankled in his heart. He determined to be revenged. From the supper he went directly to the palace of the high priest, where he found the council assembled, 
and he offered to betray Jesus into their hands. The priests were greatly rejoiced. These leaders of Israel had been given the privilege of receiving Christ as their Savior without money and without price. But they refused the precious gift offered them in the most tender spirit of constraining love. They refused to accept that salvation which is of more value than gold, and bought their Lord for thirty pieces of silver. Judas had indulged avarice until it overpowered every good trait of his character. He grudged the offering made to Jesus. His heart burned with envy that the Savior should be the recipient of a gift suitable for the monarchs of the earth. For a sum far less than the box of ointment cost, he betrayed his Lord. The disciples were not like Judas. They loved the Savior, but they did not rightly appreciate his exalted character. Had they realized what he had done for them, they would have felt that nothing bestowed upon him was wasted. The wise men from the East who knew so little of Jesus, had shown a truer appreciation of the honor due him. They brought precious gifts to the Savior and bowed in homage before him when he was but a babe and cradled in a manger. Christ values acts of heartfelt courtesy. When anyone did him a favor, with heavenly politeness he blessed the actor. He did not refuse the simplest flower plucked by the hand of a child, and offered to him in love. He accepted the offerings of children, and blessed the givers, inscribing their names in the book of life. In the scriptures, Mary's anointing of Jesus is mentioned as distinguishing her from the other Marys. Acts of love and reverence for Jesus are an evidence of faith in him as the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit mentions as evidences of woman's loyalty to Christ, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Christ delighted in the earnest desire of Mary to do the will of her Lord. He accepted the wealth of pure affection which his disciples did not, would not understand. The desire that Mary had to do this service for her Lord was of more value to Christ than all the precious ointment in the world, because it expressed her appreciation of the world's Redeemer. It was the love of Christ that constrained her. The matchless excellence of the character of Christ filled her soul. That ointment was a symbol of the heart of the giver. It was the outward demonstration of a love fed by heavenly streams until it overflowed. The work of Mary was just the lesson the disciples needed to show them that the expression of their love for him would be pleasing to Christ. He had been everything to them, and they did not realize that soon they would be deprived of his presence, that soon they could offer him no token of their gratitude for his great love. The loneliness of Christ, separated from the heavenly courts, living the life of humanity, was never understood or appreciated by the disciples as it should have been. He was often grieved because his disciples did not give him that which he should have received from them. He knew that if they were under the influence of the heavenly angels that accompanied him, they too would think no offering of sufficient value to declare the heart's spiritual affection. Their after-knowledge gave them a true sense of the many things they might have done for Jesus, expressive of the love and gratitude of their hearts, while they were near him. When Jesus was no longer with them, and they felt, indeed, as sheep without a shepherd, they began to see how they might have shown him attentions that would have brought gladness to his heart. They no longer cast blame upon Mary, but upon themselves. Oh, if they could have taken back their censoring, their presenting the poor as more worthy of the gift than was Christ. They felt the reproof keenly as they took from the cross the bruised body of their Lord. The same want is evident in our world today, but few appreciate all that Christ is to them. If they did, 
the great love of Mary would be expressed, the anointing would be freely bestowed, the expensive ointment would not be called a waste. Nothing would be thought too costly to give for Christ, no self-denial or self-sacrifice too great to be endured for His sake. The words spoken in indignation, To what purpose is this waste? brought vividly before Christ the greatest sacrifice ever made, the gift of Himself as the propitiation for a lost world. The Lord would be so bountiful to His human family that it could not be said of Him that He could do more. In the gift of Jesus, God gave all heaven. From a human point of view, such a sacrifice was a wanton waste. To human reasoning, the whole plan of salvation is a waste of mercies and resources. Self-denial and wholehearted sacrifice meet us everywhere. Well may the heavenly host look with amazement upon the human family who refuse to be uplifted and enriched with the boundless love expressed in Christ. Well may they exclaim, Why this great waste? But the atonement for a lost world was to be full, abundant, and complete. Christ's offering was exceedingly abundant to reach every soul that God had created. It could not be restricted so as not to exceed the number who would accept the great gift. All men are not saved, yet the plan of redemption is not a waste because it does not accomplish all that its liberality has provided for. There must be enough and to spare. Simon, the host, had been influenced by the criticism of Judas upon Mary's gift, and he was surprised at the conduct of Jesus. His Pharisaic pride was offended. He knew that many of his guests were looking upon Christ with distrust and displeasure. Simon said in his heart, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. By curing Simon of leprosy, Christ had saved him from a living death. But now Simon questioned whether the Savior were a prophet. Because Christ allowed this woman to approach him, because he did not indignantly spurn her as one whose sins were too great to be forgiven, because he did not show that he realized she had fallen, Simon was tempted to think that he was not a prophet. Jesus knows nothing of this woman who is so free in her demonstrations, he thought, or he would not allow her to touch him. But it was Simon's ignorance of God and of Christ that led him to think as he did. He did not realize that God's Son must act in God's way, with compassion, tenderness, and mercy. Simon's way was to take no notice of Mary's penitent service her act of kissing Christ's feet and anointing them with ointment, was exasperating to his hard-heartedness. He thought that if Christ were a prophet, he would recognize sinners and rebuke them. To this unspoken thought the Savior answered, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. As did Nathan with David, Christ concealed his home thrust under the veil of a parable. He threw upon his host the burden of pronouncing sentence upon himself. Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. By the two debtors of the parable, Simon and the woman were represented. Jesus did not design to teach that different degrees of obligation should be felt by the two persons, for each owed a debt of gratitude that never could be repaid. But Simon felt himself more righteous than Mary, and Jesus desired him to see how great his guilt really was. He would show him 
that his sin was greater than hers, as much greater as a debt of five hundred pence exceeds a debt of fifty pence. Simon now began to see himself in a new light. He saw how Mary was regarded by one who was more than a prophet. He saw that with keen prophetic eye Christ read her heart of love and devotion. Shame seized upon him, and he realized that he was in the presence of one superior to himself. I entered into thine house, Christ continued. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but with tears of repentance prompted by love, Mary hath washed my feet, and wiped them with the hair of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, whom you despise, since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Christ recounted the opportunities Simon had had to show his love for his Lord and his appreciation of what had been done for him. Plainly, yet with delicate politeness, the Savior assured his disciples that his heart is grieved when his children neglect to show their gratitude to him by words and deeds of love. The heart-searcher read the motive that led to Mary's action, and he saw also the spirit that prompted Simon's words. Seest thou this woman? he said to him. She is a sinner. I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Simon's coldness and neglect toward the Savior showed how little he appreciated the mercy he had received. He had thought he honored Jesus by inviting him to his house, but he now saw himself as he really was. While he thought himself reading his guest, his guest had been reading him. He saw how true Christ's judgment of him was. His religion had been a robe of Phariseeism. He had despised the compassion of Jesus. He had not recognized him as the representative of God. While Mary was a sinner pardoned, he was a sinner unpardoned. The rigid rule of justice he had desired to enforce against her condemned him. Simon was touched by the kindness of Jesus in not openly rebuking him before the guests. He had not been treated as he desired Mary to be treated. He saw that Jesus did not wish to expose his guilt to others, but sought by a true statement of the case to convince his mind, and by pitying kindness to subdue his heart. Stern denunciation would have hardened Simon against repentance, but patient admonition convinced him of his error. He saw the magnitude of the debt which he owed his Lord. His pride was humbled, he repented, and the proud Pharisee became a lowly, self-sacrificing disciple. Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to his unsullied purity, and in his strength she had overcome. When to human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities, and in Mary these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace she became a partaker of the divine nature. The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who had sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulchre. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. You may say, I am sinful, very sinful. 
You may be, but the worse you are, the more you need Jesus. He turns no weeping contrite one away. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage. Freely will he pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. Christ might commission the angels of heaven to pour out the vials of his wrath on our world, to destroy those who are filled with hatred of God. He might wipe this dark spot from his universe, but he does not do this. He is today standing at the altar of incense, presenting before God the prayers of those who desire his help. The souls that turn to him for refuge, Jesus lifts above the accusing and the strife of tongues. No man or evil angel can impeach these souls. Christ unites them to his own divine human nature. They stand beside the great sin-bearer, in the light proceeding from the throne of God. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us.